Worcester, Vermont. Let's try it again. Hello, hello, Worcester, Vermont. Wow. Well, my name is Chad Hollister. I live up on Hampshire Hill Road, and the beautiful thing about this very first Worcester Arts Fest is so does everybody else. And as I was walking around, I was talking to Freedom. We actually didn't get to finish our conversation, but I was, my beautiful wife, Katie O'Rourke, who also is right here, that um, uh, helped uh, on our, our crew of uh, team members. She sees it in advance. I do not. Now, as I, we were here yesterday starting to set up, I started to get so excited. And here it is. This is incredible. Everybody is from Worcester, Vermont. And I'm so excited, yes! And I am so excited to meet every single one of you. <clears throat> Late gig last night, sorry. And uh, so um, please feel free um, to wander around, meet the artists, you're gonna meet musicians, you're gonna meet poets, you're gonna meet authors today, and uh, just relish in our beautiful community of Worcester, Vermont. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you. This is our very first inaugural Worcester Arts Fest, and the, the idea came by a handsome gentleman that lives uh, up on the Gould Hill there. I first met him and his lovely wife when they were selling blueberries, and that was our first introduction to this gentleman from uh, Western Kentucky. Don't mess that up, by the way. Uh, I know they spent some time in Texas, but he is Kentucky, but for uh, about 40 years they've lived here. So um, I'm going to introduce to you, I got this call from a gentleman, David Book, and he said, I'm thinking about bringing these Worcester artists together because there's so many talented, I'm not doing his uh, accent any justice, sorry, uh, but, uh, and I think because there's so many, much talent here, why don't we bring them all together for an arts fest? What do you think? And I said, uh, yes, I, I think that's a great idea. And, uh, and then he said, well, secondly, would you like to help? <laughs> I said, um, yes. So everybody that David asked, I'm pretty sure said yes. And our, our committee will talk about all of them today. But I'd like to introduce to you, uh, to kick off this very first uh, Worcester Arts Fest. He is uh, a, a wonderful human. He is an author. He is a historian. He is a storyteller. He is an educator. Please welcome, he doesn't like this title, but I'm going to say the brainchild of the Worcester Arts Fest, Mr. David Book! Thank you, Chad. This is, this is, wow. This is incredible. It really is. And I am very, very happy and grateful for your presence and for all those that will follow later on today, I'm sure. And for so many people, so many efforts. I've got to mention their names. Here are the names of the steering committee. All of them are here, I'm sure, except for one or two who have students in, in games today that are important to them and indeed we're glad that they have participated anyway so here they are and let me read the names and let's give them a big hand with after i read them all julia hewitt caitlin hawanski alan gilbert deb bogart nehai shelka chad hollister mike close and katie o'rourke Probably the most exciting thing that I have done since I moved to Worcester 37 years ago is to write this book, The Cow That Tried to Swallow the Potato. And you know, when, when we began our historical society back in 2004, there was really no history of this little town. And a number of us, especially Doug Hull, felt that we ought to have one. And I said to myself, no way. This little town doesn't have that much history. Long story short, after four or five years of research, 350 pages about Worcester, Vermont. 
with another volume hopefully on the way within the next few years. You never know. Especially if you're tell, you tell us some of the stories that you have hidden away. So this is, the, the, this is one of six books, actually, that I have written. And I write niche books. When I see a need for a book, I work my way into writing it. So my most recent book <laughs> is a book that I'm sure you will search for quickly after I read a couple of excerpts here. It was uh, in view of the 75th anniversary of the Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge in Texas, in Cameron County, Texas. <laughs> yes. And i <clears throat> an excellent book, really. It was very good. Because Julia Hewitt had a hand in it. No doubt about it. But it's my joy to read just a couple of excerpts from this book, because I think most of you have it, but if you don't, I just happen to have a few extra copies available in the writer's tent. So this, this book is anecdotal, basically. I love local history. I've been involved in local history for years and years, taught a, uh, developed a curriculum on local history at Cabot School where I taught for a number of years. And so this, this book really reflects the soul, if you would, of Worcester, Vermont. So just a few excerpts real quickly. And Chad is going to give me a signal when I'm near, near the end, okay? Uh, you all know Tom Lang, right? Most of you know where he lives, down here right across from Balsam. That house is probably the oldest house in the village. It was built by the Hutchinson family back in the 1820s. Elias Hutchinson was one of the men who lived in that house. He had business in Montpelier on September the 19th, 1833. Notice had been given in the city that blasting would take place on the ledges behind the first state house, since construction of a new state house required the ledges be removed. Ample warning was given to seek safety, but 33-year-old Hutchinson apparently was either unaware or disregarded the warning, trusting to his own skill to keep out of harm's way. The explosion took place and sent fragments of rock flying in all directions. He saw one coming directly towards him and started to run, keeping it in view, but he had not gone far before it struck him with such force as to knock him to the ground. Those who saw him fall hastened to his assistance, conveyed him to a house nearby, and at once summoned medical aid. But all efforts for his relief were unavailing, and he expired in great agony a few hours after receiving the fatal injury. And that is from uh, uh, a newspaper article. This document is printed in its entirety in the appendices. His widow, Eunice, appealed to the state legislature for some relief a few months later, and after considerable squabbling among legislators, I can't believe they would do that, would you? Where's Avery? Avery? Tell us that's not true. She was granted an unspecified sum. Mr. Hutchinson may have been the only person to lose his life at the State House, although many Vermont citizens have surely been injured there. Ooh. I love a little cuts like that. Sometimes I get carried away. And here is a little anecdote about a man whose name is not disclosed, but who is a resident, drives the Worcester stage, I know that immediately identifies him for you, <laughs> caused abundant amusement in county court Friday afternoon. He fell asleep in his seat and did justice to his 250 or more pounds by using his snoring apparatus to its limit. He fell asleep in his seat and carried on like you would not believe. Finally, the nasal exuberations he emitted took precedence over all the other proceedings. The sheriffs rapped on their desks for order in the court, but the sleeper slept on and only gained in strength and volume in his efforts. Finally, the scene became so embarrassing to the neighbors of the snore that they punched him in the ribs until he awoke, thus brought the concert to a close. <laughs> Okay, let's go to two more real quick. I love this story. This happened up on the hill, up on Hanshaw Hill, Chad. So this was a story about uh, the Howison cabin. The windows in the house had been, this is in uh, 1922. The windows in the house had been boarded up for the winter months, and the very first night the family went there, 
to spend a weekend in the spring. The very first night they went there, one of the Hampshire Hill inhabitants, who I was told had just gotten out of Windsor Prison, decided he would break into the house. I haven't any idea what he was going to do. And this is, this is from the words of Thelma Howison Healy, who experienced this experience in 1922. So anyway, that night I woke up and my mother had her lamp out on the end of the big wood stove and she talked low to me. Babes, you keep quiet and don't you make a move. Don't talk and you stay where you are. I was in bed and I knew something was wrong and I did exactly what my mother told me to do. My brother had gotten up in the meantime and I heard my mother tell him to stay quiet and stay still and she would take care of it. In the meantime, I heard the screech sound of a board being pulled off the north window in the parlor facing the mountain. Then my mother shot out over the top of the window using the little revolver she had. The shot went right over his head. I can remember to this day his, the sound of his feet as he ran across the front lawn where the stone ledges run under our house and I could hear this hollow sound from his footsteps on the ledge as he ran off down the road. My mother immediately got dressed, and in a couple of hours in, in broke daylight, and we had breakfast. Then she said to my brother and myself, we're going to track that man who ran down the road. So my brother, my mother, and myself, the three of us, looking pretty forlorn, went down the road and tracked him right across the bridge by the schoolhouse and up a little hill to his house and found him sitting out on his front porch, rocking back and forth in a straight chair. My mother asked him if he'd enjoyed his evening and he muttered a reply of some sort, and then she said to him, Now, mister, I'm going to show you that I can shoot and hit my target if I want to. So she shot at these pails that were hanging on the side of his barn. I think there were five, and she hit each one with a ping sound. Ping, 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 ping. I just stood there. Then I remember her saying, Now, mister, you can see I can hit my target if I want to. Don't ever let me see you around my house again, or you will get the same treatment as the pails. We never did see him again around our house either. That really happened. Worcester women are tough. One last little anecdote here. And this is one of my favorites. Brad Sinner, a well-known character who's still living around here. Uh, I think he's in Montpelier now. Um, he actually gave us our first sign that's still out there on the road uh, a number of years ago. He had a friend by the name of Ferd Fedora, and they were town uh, scallywags. They were, they were some characters. One evening, he writes, Ferd and I were bored. We decided to run through town yelling a dirty word. The problem was we honestly didn't know any dirty words. After being sent to the store for a package with a plain brown wrapper, and finding out it wasn't a box of cookies. We were told not to mention that word to anyone. So we derive Kotex would be a perfect <laughs> word to lay on our town. In our high-pitched pre-bus... Pre <laughs> yeah, our early voices. <laughs> we yelled Kotex while running down Main Street. After a couple of attempts and no responses, we gave up. We'll come over to the writer's tent if you want to talk a little more, and we've got some extra books over there. Thank you, Chad. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Dodge. How many know Harry Dodge? New Harry Dodge. Good. 
Barry Dodge was born in 1909, reared on Gould Hill. While in high school at U32, his grandson, Christopher Dodge, recorded a number of his grandfather's interesting stories. If you know Gould Hill, you will appreciate this tale. It was a nice March afternoon. My father had just gone to work. He had said earlier that he wanted to get rid of that old pug, a one-horse sleigh, that was sitting in the back of our home. My brother and I decided to take the pug for a small ride. We got dressed and dragged the pug to the top of a nearby field and took off the shafts, the part of the sleigh that connects the sleigh to the horse. We started to slide down the hill. Now remember, this is on top of Gould Hill, near Duga Road. If we had planned our trip correctly, we would cross the property of many of our neighbors. We wanted to end up in the lowlands by the law north branch of the Winooski River. We had gone about one half mile when we came upon a stone wall fence. The wall was covered with a few feet of snow. This was between the road we wanted to cross and us. Needless to say, we could not stop the sleigh, so we had no choice but to jump the stone wall. I told my brother to duck his head, and I did the same. We crossed the wall and took off into the air like a bird. We touched down with a crash and kept going. We heard a ping noise, and my brother asked me, what's that? I replied, that was the top strand of the Richardson's barbed wire fence. We kept going and heard the noise again, and I knew that we had made it into the lad's fence. By this time, we were on level ground and headed for another stone fence. Again, we hit and landed 10 feet up in a tree. The seat went over our heads and into another tree. We landed with the sleigh on the ground. That same minute, the seat landed in front of us on the ground and split into many pieces. Luckily, we were not hurt. We got out of the mess, and I said to my brother, well, no problem in getting rid of that sled. We went home and stoked the fire. <laughs> Thank you. People are coming to the tent. Thank you so much, David. How about a hand for Mr. David Book? <laughs> Aptly titled David Book. You get that? Right? He's a writer. Um, so I want to uh, just put a huge uh, thanks out um, that I did not do in the beginning, and we'll, we'll be doing it all day, but to our sponsors, because with an event like this, um, you got to have some money. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about this as well is that each artist like often pretty much all the time when there is an arts fest you need to pay for your booth and then you hope that you make money to pay back what you make back what you paid at this arts fest because of the grants that we received um, each artist is receiving an honorarium is actually getting paid to come and sell their art that's cool so the reason that that is is because of our sponsors Ben and Jerry's Community Bank National Life Group, the Washington Electric Co-op, Wyndham Foundation, the Worcester Historical Society, and the Vermont Arts Council. Could we give them a big round of applause, please? Yeah, thank you. So we appreciate um, their support. And also, as we were drive, as I was driving home, I was driving somewhere, and I looked and I saw these signs that were just you know, meet the artists, see your friends. The 10th of June, is start, it, it, it starts and ends Worcester Arts Fest. And I just, we all giggled because we had no idea who did it. None of us had done it that were on the board. We're like, oh, that, that was, so, you know, that, no, that was, but it was Mike Menninger did, did these signs. We just want to say thanks to Mike because we, we had no idea, but that was, it was just so genius and kind, and um, we were just trying to raise awareness that th this thing is happening in everybody's backyard. So anyway, um, wonderful. Uh, so Avram, are you set? Okay. I, so you, you recognize his name, certainly. He is a legislator. I, I've met Avram and supported him um, throughout the years as he has um, spoken for us in the legislature and uh, a very kind human that, that cares about community. And um, so it's a, a, I've seen him 
in, in, at gigs in Morrisville. I've seen him just hanging out at the dump wanting to talk to people. Who does that? I don't, who wants to spend more time at the dump? Well, Avram does to be able to get to the community. I think it's beautiful. So uh, please welcome to the stage to sing um, and bring you some stories behind a couple of Yiddish songs, Avram Pat. Hi there. Uh, so, uh, I am going to sing a couple of Yiddish songs. Yiddish is the language spoken by most of the uh, Jews who lived in, in Eastern Europe uh, and who were the, the source of the, the largest, by far, uh, immigration of Jewish people to this country starting in the late 1900s and the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and it's my first language. I grew up speaking Yiddish. I, I, I didn't start learning English, I'm told, uh, till I was in kindergarten. And kids that age really don't know that they're even learning an, another language. But we spoke Yiddish at home, so it's my mama lush and my mother tongue. Um, and uh, the, um, I, I did want to say before, before I start into what I'm going to do, that uh, this uh, this morning when I was pulling clothes out of a drawer to, um, to get dressed, uh, there's a drawer with uh, t-shirts in it, and the, uh, usually I just take the next t-shirt uh, that, that's in line, the next t-shirt, I'm, um, I'm not going to open it up because it has some holes in it now, but the next t-shirt uh, in line, which I decided to wear, uh, was a t-shirt, it's a great t-shirt that says in big white letters, Worcester. All right. Um, and we moved to Worcester in the uh, late 1989, and I believe at the next town meeting, the first town meeting that, that I went to, the Worcester Historical Society was selling these t-shirts. Um, and this one is still more or less in one piece, and I decided to, I decided, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll wear that. I'm not gonna open my shirt right now because it really has a bunch of holes in it, but if someone wants to see it later, you can. Um, <laughs> So, um, over time, I've been uh, one of the only uh, people speaking Yiddish in the state of Vermont, although when I first moved to Vermont in 1970, uh, I discovered that there were, in fact, in some communities in Vermont, uh, people that went back a few generations that, that spoke Yiddish, including in Barrie, in Rutland, in Burlington, maybe a, a, a few other places. Uh, but those people are gone. Uh, and, and so there's, there's very few of us now that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that do speak Yiddish. So I've made a point of, of trying to stand up and do Yiddish things at different places, including in the legislature, uh, where we have a devotional every day when the house starts. And I've sung actually both of the songs that I'm going to uh, sing today. Uh, and also in, in a different venue, uh, given a short talk uh, on the incredible, uh, devastating power uh, of Yiddish curses. Um, they're not like curses that, that uh, you know that are two-word curses, one of which is an obscene word. They're not, they're, they're worse than that. Um, uh, so, um, that, I'm, I'm going to do these, uh, these two songs. The second song is one that I will uh, help, uh, ask for your help to sing. This one is is a, a, a uplifting song about hope for a better world. Uh, the words are by the a beloved Yiddish poet named Avram Reizen. He wrote poems for people of all ages. A number of his uh, things were set to music. So I'll give you my translation first. It's called the Snayali, the new song. No matter how distant the time of love and of peace is. It will arrive, whether sooner or later. That time is not a dream. I hear the song of love and joy, of mighty voices singing, and every note of the song announces the sun has risen. The night is ending, the world awakens, filled with hope, good cheer, and striving. In the air, you hear a voice calling to spirit power, and life. 
Und so wie weit noch sein die Zeit von Liebe und von Schollen. Doch kommen wird sie früh zu spät, die Zeit es ist kein Schollen. Doch kommen wird sie früh zu spät, die Zeit es ist kein Schollen. Ich hör das Lied von Liebe Fried, die mächtige Gesangen. Und jeder Ton von Lied sagt an, die Sonne ist aufgegangen. Und jeder Ton von Lied sagt an, die Sonne ist aufgegangen. Es eckt die Nacht. Die Welt erwacht, voll Hoffnung, Lust und Streben. Du hörst den Luft, a Stimme ruft, zu Mut und Kraft und Leben. Du hörst in Luft, a Stimme ruft, zu Mut und Kraft und Leben. Noch einmal, that means another time. Well, I'm going to do something different, though. Um, uh, this is a, a song uh, that I will ask you to um, help me sing with one word. So to do that, uh, I need to ask, and I think there are some people who know the answer, what is the most well-known word in the Yiddish language? Schmuck. <laughs> no, that's a, fa that's a first. It's it's two it's one syllable two letters. Oi. All right. Oi. Okay. Oi. oi. Okay. Um, so oi oi can is a is a um, it can be said as just as an exclamation oi. You can repeat it a few times to just sort of let it sink in. Oi 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 oi. oi. <laughs> or you can add a, a second word oi ve. Oi ve. Oi ve means uh, pain, and when you say oi ve, that's really uh, an expression of, of misery, yeah. of miserableness, okay? Um, and so uh, this is actually a children's song. I am told that it was the first song that I ever sang as, as a very young child. Um, and what it, what it means, roughly translated, is oi, my little head hurts. Oi, my little head hurts, and my little head, a little apple is turning around and around. Oi, my head hurts. Why a little apple? Because in Yiddish, a little head is a little, is a kepala, and a little apple is an epala. And that's, that's the logic of, of this song. Oi, my little foot hurts. Oi, my little foot hurts. In my little foot, a little nut. A little Nisala is turning around and around. Oi, my foot hurts. Oi, my stomach hurts. Oi, my stomach hurts. And my little stomach, a little drum is turning around and around and around. Oi, my stomach hurts. Okay, so in order for you to help me sing, I'm just going to ask you to sing the word oi when it comes around in the song. Um, uh, in order to do that, I, w I want you to start thinking about things that are really um, upsetting to you right now, uh, making you miserable. Okay, I want you to like get this, just keep it to yourself. Don't, you don't need to talk about. It. But just like think about things that are really a problem in your own life. Maybe maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your neighbor's dog. But just, I, I, I want you to be thinking about the things in your own personal life that are making you miserable, and 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 attach that to the word oi, and then let's take it up a notch. And I want you to think about everything that's wrong in the world. Okay. 
uh, whether it's political, whether it's in Montpelier, whether it's in Congress, whether it's Donald Trump, whatever or, you know, or climate change or whatever is really worrying you. I want I want you to add that and layer it on top of everything that you're thinking about that's wrong in your own life and your own surroundings. I want you to think about that and 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 and. and put that into your oi. Okay, so every time the word comes around in the song, I'm just gonna raise my hand like this and give me, give me your best oi. So let's practice, okay? Uh, one, two, three. Oi! Okay, that was pretty good. Um, but we need to add one other characteristic, and that is, uh, in Yiddish, the word is krechts. I, I want you to like squeeze it out of you. Up you know, from here and up and out, and, okay? So, it's, oi, okay? Yeah, that's right. So, we'll try it one more time. Oi! Good, okay, we got it. So, here, here we go. The song is going to start with an oi, and you give me your best oi every time I raise my finger in the air. Are you ready? One, two, three. Oi, my capella taught me away. Oi, my capella taught me away. In my capella, keikel sich an Apple. Oi, my capella taught me away. Oi, my fissola taught me away. Oi, my fissola taught me away. In my fissola, keikel sich an Nisola. Oi, my fissola taught me away. Oi, my beichela taught me away. Oi, my beichela taught me away. In my beichela, keikel sich an Hi, Gala. Oi, my Bachele taught me a way. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day. How about a hand for Mr. Avram Pat? Some Yiddish songs and the stories behind them. Beautiful. So we're going to have a little, uh, we, it's pretty awesome here. We are running ahead of schedule. And let me tell you, if you look at your program, please be sure to get one there. There are friends circulating around with them. And uh, uh, in, in a little bit, we will have Werner John um, playing some Native, Native American style flutes. So that will be happening at 1 o'clock uh, in just a few minutes. So we'll uh, have some music here and... Uh, Come on back to hear Werner John, and please um, visit our wonderful artists and hear the stories behind what they do. Great to have you. Happy Worcester Arts Fest, everybody. Music coming soon. Thanks. To keep it going here, and um, Werner John has been uh, living in the Worcester area for about the past six years, but for 35 years has been a self-employed entrepreneur, and... Uh, Certainly welcome you to visit his amazing uh, tent over there. Many of the flutes that you see over there were made by him in Worcester, Vermont. And um, he's going to be playing some uh, Native American style flute today and uh, giving you some of the stories behind them. And so please uh, welcome to the Worcester Arts Fest stage, Werner John. It's great to be back. What a nice uh, event. What a nice day. Pretty nice day for it. So, um, these are my flutes. They're made of cedar and other softwoods so that I don't even need a lathe. I can do it in a very small space.
going here at the Worcester Arts Fest, the very first annual, well, we're not going to say annual, I think we might do it every couple years, is the honest answer. These festivals are a lot of work. I've been a part of many festivals, but I've never helped plan one. I don't know how many I'll do, uh, uh, continue planning, but there, I, I, I honor the people that do them because um, there's so many, so many helpers that made this, uh, made this day happen. And of course, this day cannot happen without our artists and our musicians. My name is Chad Hollister. I am a full-time touring musician, uh, much like uh, many of the uh, fathers, mothers, and siblings of, of Worcester, Vermont. We realized as I, Katie and I moved here with a six-month-old Riley Odelia, who is graduating next week from high school, woo! Um, that being a musician was, uh, is, was pretty normal here in town. So um, it's great. Now, uh, next up, we have the Purple House Trio, and we have, uh, we have Rowan right here on the fiddle, we have Tenzo on the cajon, and we have Mela... No, wait a minute. You're not Mela. No, of course, this is the amazing Michael Close. Mela's not feeling well, so Michael is uh, gladly filling in, and when you hear them, you'll understand why I say gladly. Um, uh, and it's just uh, great to have uh, the, the, the Landis uh, Marinello um, family here today. They're playing fiddle tunes and, uh, by the Landis Marinello siblings. So please give a warm Worcester Arts Fest welcome to the Purple House Trio.
How about a hand for the Purple House Trio? Amazing. My special guest, Michael Close, and thanks to uh, Rowan on the fiddle and Tenzo on the cajon. Um, boy, we, it, it just continues to uh, amaze me and amaze me and amaze me even more. Um, and uh, up, uh, upcoming, we're just uh, going to take a little breather here, and, um, uh, but within uh, just a couple of minutes, we're going to get Joe Hoansky up here, who is going to be performing on the Oud. Do you know what an oud is? Well, you're about to learn. It's an amazing uh, stringed instrument that um, has a beautiful, beautiful tone to it. So we're going to do that. And then as you see happening out there, brewing, you can see some, some young Irish dancers out there that is going, they're, they're, they are going to, um, they are coming from the Garrett School of Irish Dance and be accompanied by amazing musicians one more time. So all kinds of wonderful things coming up here. Uh, Alan Gilbert, our amazing local author is coming. Sarah Bell is coming. Michael Close is gonna do some stuff uh, as well. And um, let's see, let me just check here. How are we? Uh, I think there are a few more minutes. Rick, I believe, is still in the town hall recording some stories and poems, if anybody is interested in, in doing that. Um, but uh, more music to come. Stay here, right here at the Worcester Arts Fest. Food, art, music, beautiful. Thanks for being here. All right, folks. So I was learning a little bit about the oud. It is in a Middle, a middle Eastern instrument. Joe was, Joe was uh, schooling me a little bit on it. And um, this one has 11 strings, two, four, six, eight, ten. And then the low string is just a single string. Um, so you, you think about uh, uh, guitars like, say, the mandolin that has uh, eight strings, two strings uh, each, whereas the six-string guitar just has one string. So it's a very specific instrument, and it also is a very quiet instrument. So we're going to do our best to mic it up, but during, um, during Joe's set, if you can uh, just really try and... Uh, Try and listen in, and uh, we'll j Josh here. By the way, this is Josh Needling from MSR Sound on the sound today. How about a hand for Josh? Um, so, uh, without further ado, Mr. Joe Hoansky on the oot.
Mr. Joe Hoansky on the traditional oud. Come on now. What a specific sound that is. Just takes you, takes you over there to another place. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, so we uh, um, up, up. Uh, we've got some amazing Irish dance and music coming, and we're gonna get that dial in, get our stage ready, make sure that they're not gonna uh, fly off of it. And, uh, and stay tuned, because it's going to be really exciting, amazing things. And then I see Alan right here, amazing author who's going to be reading. And, and just so you know, uh, Rick Agrin, our, our local poet, is in, in, the, uh, in town hall uh, right behind us. And if you have a story, that dog definitely has a story. If you have a story or a poem that you would like to record, Rick is doing that. So if you have that, uh, go and visit him. And if for some reason you don't get to do it today, um, we'll find a time for you somehow. Okay, thanks. More music to come here at the first annual Worcester Arts Fest. Thank you. Um, without further ado, we're going to continue uh, the Worcester Arts Fest uh, program, as, we, as it were. And um, it's really fun to see some familiar faces in this band. My bodyguard, Dan, over there, he's, he protects me wherever I go. Hire him at the Barry Opera House. No, wait, he hires me. No, wait, I don't know what we do. Um, but we have the band uh, One More Time and the Garrett School of Irish Dance. I'd like to introduce Garrelisa to uh, let you know a little bit about her crew, and then off we go to Ireland. tonight and thank you to the Worcester Arts Festival for having us on their inaugural year. It's very exciting to be here. Um, we are going to show you a collection of dances and tunes from different parts of Ireland and different parts of Irish dancing history. So you'll see some really contemporary dances and you'll see some really old dances um, and everything in between. Old style, new style. Um, so uh, sometimes we might introduce them and sometimes we might just uh, do them for you. Uh, we have had a couple of last minute changes to our roster, uh, so um, we're just going to be rolling with it, um, and we're really excited to show you uh, a lot of different things today. So thank you all so much for being here, um, and I'm going to bring out my dancers for their first dance. <laughs> Thank you. 
and on because it's very different. So you just saw a light jig, which is a soft shoe dance, and we're about to do an old style traditional set. So if you've ever heard of Shano's dancing, Shano's means old style in the Irish language. And uh, this is a dance that's kind of done in the old style. So it's fluid, the arms can move, and it's really about matching the footwork with the music. Um, so this is a set dance, which means that these steps were designed to go with this particular tune. This is a tune by the name of Maggie Pickens, and the dance also goes by the name Maggie Pickens. Uh, so we're going to show you just a few steps and uh, give you some of that tune as well. of Mallow, which is a very traditional Cayley dance. Um, if you're ever interested in trying Cayley dancing, we do typically run a monthly Cayley class with live music um, in Montpelier. Our location changes a bit, um, and we're taking the summer off, but if you're interested, you can check out our website or our Facebook page. Uh, either of ours, potentially, there might be a One More Time Facebook page coming soon, who knows? Um, but the Garrett School of Irish Dance, and we'll publicize it there if you're ever interested. Uh, or you can come find me after and I'll write your email down if you're interested. All right, so here comes Break Some Mallow.
here, so I'm going to ask our musicians uh, to play a little musical set for you, if you wouldn't mind. percussive shoes. So the red ones I had on earlier were also percussive, but those are more typical of old style dancing where you just wear whatever shoes you have, <coughs> usually with a, a hard sole. Um, these hard shoes have actual tips and heels on them, so they're kind of like the Irish equivalent of a tap shoe, but tap shoes have metal tips and heels, and Irish hard shoes these days are made of fiberglass, actually. The tips and heels are fiberglass, um, and they make a lot of noise. Um, and they're, they're designed to be percussive. So the steps that you're about to see are treble jig steps. So the very first number we did was a jig, but we danced it in soft shoes. And now we're doing a jig. So musically, it's the same type of tune, um, but we're going to be doing it in hard shoes. So the steps we'll be doing are pretty traditional. They're old um, and they're um, simpler. And then later on, uh, at the end of our set, you'll see some hard shoe dancing that's a little bit more contemporary. Um, so this is a treble jig featuring some two of our dancers who have just learned hard shoe for the first time this year. So we're gonna, this dance is a little bit of a performance and a little bit of a demonstration of one of the strategies that we teach percussive dancing because it's so important that you're learning the rhythms while you're learning the footwork and what your body needs to do. And so we often do a call and response strategy like you might use when you're learning music. Um, and so you'll see some pieces of that in this dance as well. So here's a treble jig for you.
more of the day. Uh, so we're going to do um, one more for you. This is a reel. And uh, we're going to start it with, again, a little bit of more contemporary footwork and hard shoe. And then you'll get a chance to see some real steps from all of our dancers. Uh, some of them are very traditional and some of them are more contemporary things that you might see if you went to an Irish dance competition, which is called a fesh. Um, and we'll hear some great reels as well. Uh, thank you so much again to the Worcester Arts Festival for having us. What a wonderful first year event. Uh, we're really thrilled to be here. Thank you so much to our fabulous friends one more time. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. Again, we are the Garrett School of Irish Dance, and uh, we hope you enjoy our final number. time in the Garrett School of Irish Dance. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Everybody, welcome to the very first Worcester Arts Fest here in Worcester, Vermont, featuring Worcester artists. Sometimes we headed a little bit outside, especially with our friend Elizabeth that uh, has introduced so many Worcesterites to uh, the art of Irish dance. It was wonderful to have uh, this crew here today. Um, so as we continue to move on, um, I just uh, want to put a huge thanks out because he has arrived. Uh, Julia Hewitt, one of my, uh, the members of our team, has, has let me know that the gentleman that created the beautiful signs to make sure that everybody knew right up until today that the Arts Fest was happening. Mike Menninger is here. Where are you, Mike? Where are you, buddy? Yeah, thank you, Mike. We, uh, we were... We were <laughs> 
we were talking about how we were trying to figure out who the heck did it in our crew, and it was none of us. It was you. So thank you for your creativity and uh, and adding uh, to our to our arts fest and helping folks know to come on down. So um, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, David Book off the road with Van Halen. Come on. The road is long and rough out there. Not for an old man, huh? Um, there are other artists in Worcester than are here today. Get the word out. This is not a gimmicky thing. This is the real Worcester right here. We want to expand our outreach in years to come. There are a couple of people, for example, that I know who are not here because of their health. And I was just want to recognize them, even though they're not here, and let you know that we know that Sylvia Walker and that Nuo Shonia are known artists here in Worcester and are in poor health. So we send out a tribute to them. And thank all of you for coming. This has so far been absolutely spectacular, I think. Good job. Good job. That's David Book of the band Foo Fighters. <laughs> Just keeps changing. That was one of my favorite things. I'm a Dave, Dave Grohl a fanatic, and I was listening to an interview with Dave Grohl and, and uh, Taylor Hawkins, uh, their drummer that passed away this past year. That's a huge loss to the rock and roll world. He was uh, saying, tell, tell, they were doing this interview. He said, tell them, uh, tell them about the Saturday Night Live thing with Christopher Walken. And, and uh, he said, oh, okay, all right. So Christopher Walken was hosting. No, they, they were the band, and Christopher Walken was hosting. And, and he came to Dave. He said, so Dave, he said, so what is the emphasis on? Is it Foo or the fighters? And Dave said, uh, you know, thinking to himself, he said, I, there's not really an emphasis on anything. It's just, you know, but if you had to put emphasis on it, it would be on fighters. So Christopher Walken comes up to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, Foo Fighters! And they just bust it out. I, obviously, I think this is much funnier than anybody else ever will. My wife, Katie, has had to listen to, listen to me say this over and over again. Foo Fighters! I think it's funny. Anywho, uh, more cowbell? Anybody? More cowbell. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, an amazing local author, Alan Gilbert, coming up just in a couple minutes. So uh, stay tuned and uh, more music and poetry and uh, authors coming your way to the very first Worcester Arts Fest. Thanks again. I want to um, underline just one, you're gonna be hearing it a lot today. Our sponsors today that made this whole gig possible, we were able to pay our artists, and we also encourage you to buy their art as well, is Ben & Jerry's Community Bank, National Life Group, the Washington Electric Co-op, Wyndham Foundation, the Worcester Historical Society, and the Vermont Arts Council. Stay tuned here. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs>